Uh, thank you, Philip. Yeah, and I'll wait for the lights. Is the audio okay? Can you hear me fine? <coughs> they go down more, yeah? <coughs> Great, and uh, okay, I'll try to keep you awake. Uh, sorry, I know it's pretty dark in here. Um, <coughs> I don't even know if you can see me. I'm, I am here. Uh, the, uh, um, <coughs> uh, I also apologize. I'm, I'm coming over a cold, so I've got a little bit of a residual cough, so please, uh, uh, put up with that. Um, so I'm really looking forward to talking to you about this today. So I, the, the title of the talk, uh, um, you know, I, I get different kinds of reactions to this. Partially it's meant to evoke uh, your own reaction. So it's, you know, what does the revolution in artificial intelligence mean for physics? And this sounds, uh, you know, there's a lot of hype about uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence now. And, uh, and so some people are very excited by it and some people kind of, uh, you know, don't, react so well to such a title, and that's kind of on purpose, because I'm, I'm, uh, as a physicist, uh, I think that's, that's part of what I want to address today, is like where is the hype and where is the value, and, uh, and what are the things that we're worried about, or what are the opportunities as physicists, so I'm going to try to kind of uh, frame that. Um, so th this is work that I've been doing in the last uh, few years, basically since sabbatical, and it's uh, involved uh, collaborations with a lot of people. This isn't everybody that... Uh, I've been collaborating with recently, uh, but it's, uh, you know, I've just highlighted some of the main people, but it's kind of a it's, a, it's a very nice, diverse group of people. About half of the people are computer scientists or applied mathematicians or statisticians, and the other half roughly are physicists. Um, and then it's also been, uh, this work's been supported from, you know, from the National Science Foundation and also from uh, uh, the Moore and Sloan Foundations that came together and created something called the Moore Sloan Data Science Environments at NYU, the University of Washington, and California, Berkeley. Um, and uh, so, so, the, so I'd like to just acknowledge those groups. And NSF has been funding basically a few different projects uh, that are, that are uh, sort of uh, high energy physics related, but not the typical kind of high energy physics projects that really sit inside of a particular experiment. They're a little bit more looking at the you know, software and new analysis techniques and things like that. Okay. So I spend most of my days doing, I'm going to stand in the middle if it's all right and look at this one, but the, uh, um, I spend you know, most of my time and kind of traditionally have been working on the ATLAS experiment. So this is a picture of ATLAS when it was still being constructed. Um, you know, here's a little uh, person here, there's another person hiding back there. This is when it was uh, still being constructed and so it was you know, largely empty. Now every nook and cranny of ATLAS is filled with electronics. Um, and, uh, and this is the kind of thing that our, our data look like. So uh, this is a you know, a visualization of an actual collision that happened where particles would come down the beam pipe, uh, uh, so two protons would come in, uh, down this beam pipe and come into collision right here in the middle, and you see the spray of particles that are uh, flying out that are produced in that collision. And in this example, there are four uh, uh, special particles, these ones in red that you can see uh, make it all the way out of the detector, and I just remind you, it's not really empty. It's full of, you know, lead and, and uh, you know, all sorts of, uh, uh, of uh, electronics and things like that. So to, to get a particle, and it's about the size of a building, right? So it's, uh, to get a particle to be able to fly through that much material is special. And uh, it's also very straight, which is an indication, because there are magnetic fields here, that it's very high energy. Um, so these particles are uh, almost unambiguously muons. It's just a type of uh, uh, elementary particles. So there's four muons in this event. And you can see how they're kind of grouped together. And this is a... Uh, this is exactly what you would expect to see if you had made a Higgs boson. If you made a Higgs boson, you would predict to see collisions that look like this. So this is a candidate uh, uh, that was collected by Atlas in the search for the Higgs boson. Now, you can imagine that when we saw something like this, we were all very excited. Um, she wasn't very excited. Uh, Everyone else is excited, but she knew that you can't just look at one collision and claim a discovery. You have to work a little bit harder and do some statistical analysis. So we have to collect many such events, um, and this was the kind of evidence that really set the stage for the Higgs discovery. Um, this is when the Higgs decays into two photons. This is when the Higgs decays into like four muons, like I showed you before. And you're taking that, one of the things that I want to kind of highlight is that the the data is very complicated, right? The detector has about 100 million electronic readouts, and so, the, you know, for one collision, and, but we don't, you, you, it's hard to work with such complicated data, so what we usually do if we're looking for the Higgs, we know that the energy and momenta of these four particles sh should add up in a certain way to give us a good estimate for the mass of whatever particle produced it, if, if that's actually what happened. So if it was a Higgs boson that produced it, you would expect to see a bump, 
And that's what is happening here. The red is basically from other kinds of processes that don't involve the Higgs boson. Over here, other processes that don't involve the Higgs boson give you this nice smooth thing, but if you have a Higgs, you expect to see a little bump. And here's another bump, and the locations of those bumps uh, match up, which makes us think that we're seeing the same particle in both of these plots. So that's kind of the Higgs discovery, you know, drastically simplified. Uh, but this is, you know, this was sort of 2012, and we claimed the discovery of the Higgs boson in July 2012, and that was like, you know, a momentous occasion in my life and many, many people around the world. And curiously, the same month uh, that we announced the Higgs boson, there was this very uh, kind of seminal work uh, that, that happened in the field of deep learning. And if you were going to try to find some moment in time where deep learning took off, it was with probably, you know, roughly with this paper. Because prior to that, a lot of the same ideas for deep learning had been around for decades, but it just wasn't really, it wasn't really working, basically. And with this paper, they cobbled together a few different things, and that had to do with basically um, a lot more training data, much faster types of computing because we started using these GPUs, these graphical processing units that they use in like video games and things to be able to uh, train these neural networks much better. And then also some tricks uh, that have to do with uh, sort of getting the, uh, the system to be a little bit more stable. And uh, I don't want to get into the details of that right now, but a few different tricks came together. And then uh, this deep learning paradigm started to work. And it not only started to work, it started giving like much better results than anything that anyone had seen before. And usually the kinds of challenges that people were considering at the first had to do with image classification. So there would be thousands and thousands of images, and each image would be labeled with something like cat or dog or bird or boat or something. And these neural networks would look at the image and then try to output a prediction for what's in the image. And so uh, just a few years later, um, the, this uh, field just exploded, and the level of performance for these kinds of uh, visual tasks was actually uh, superior than human ability to do this classification task. So the superhuman performance is pretty crazy. It also makes you think a little bit, like, what does that even mean? Because humans labeled these images, right? So what's happening at that stage is that, you know, humans are either making mistakes or there's some, like, uh, not all humans agree on what's in some image or something, and the neural networks are actually learning the systematic mistakes that people are using and exploiting it, because the way the problem is set up is just how well can you, you know, you know uh, do this classification. So at this point, it's like basically perfect. It almost doesn't even make any sense anymore. So these kinds of things were exciting. Uh, it's also interesting to think of just how much progress was made in these few years. If I think about in particle physics what happened between 2012 and 2015, it doesn't really feel quite the same. Um, but what other things are going on? In addition to being able to just look at an image and say, okay, there's a cat in the image, uh, then it, you know, the, the revolutionary uh, uh, jump of being able to say the cat is over here inside this box, that's not that exciting, but okay, this is called localization. Then there's the idea that in one image there might be multiple objects. So okay, I've got a couple cats, a duck, and a dog. You know. um, and then it got a little bit more sophisticated to where you're really like outlining the image and saying this, these are the pixels associated with the dog. And this is called seg uh, segmentation. So, okay, so this you can start to imagine in various scientific contexts might be interesting. But other than that, it's very easy, I think, as a physicist to kind of make fun of this whole enterprise. You know, it, and to me, it felt like it was all about cat and dog images. And, uh, and you know, like, so where in the science, you know, wh where do, how does this imp impact me as a physicist, right? Um, so then a few other kinds of things started to happen, which looked different than the type of uh, just classification or image type of work. And so I'm going to show you some examples that will start to kind of get your creativity flowing. So here are some pictures of, of real scenes. This is still an, an image you know, land. So the, I was just ended with the ability to se segment the image. So here the colors indicate, is it a person or a car or the road or a tree or something like that? Then you start getting to the ability to actually have individual instances. So it's not just that these are all people, but you know, this is a distinct person from another one. These are distinct cars. Even though the cars are overlapping, it's able to kind of tell which part is part of the same car. And then this one is maybe the most interesting for a physicist, is it's estimating how far away are these objects. And it's not two images and doing stereoscopic vision. It's one image. So how can you estimate how far away this object is if you only have one image? Right? So if you think about it, if you look at this picture, you, there's a car, there's a person, there's a stoplight. You know how, roughly how far away those things are. How do you know that? Because you know how big cars are 
and you know how big stoplights are, and you know how big people are, right? So you're able to infer how, away, how far away these things are because of the statistical regularities of those kinds of objects, right? So this is really some kind of statistical inference that's being performed here, um, but that's, that's already quite, quite interesting. Outside of the area of, of images, there started being some really interesting work with language. So natural language and image are the two areas where machine learning has really like shown some, uh, some uh, amazing advancement recently. So one of the ideas, and this is just kind of a core concept to put in the back of your mind, is the idea of an embedding, okay? So an, a, an embedding for words is the idea that you're gonna give it a word and it's going, you're gonna have a function that takes in a word and embeds it into some you know, 40 dimensional space or 100 dimensional space or something like that. So, um, so here's just drawn in a simplistic, in simplistic way, a three dimensional embedding space. And you have the word king and queen and man and woman. And the thing that's interesting here is that if you look to see the vector that points between king and queen, and you look at the vector between man and woman, it turns out that these embeddings have learned a way of representing the words such that those vectors are basically the same. Similarly, if you look at things like walking and walked, swimming and swam, the vectors between those words are basically the same. So this is this some sort of semantics associated, associated to gender, to you know, tense. Here you, th you see uh, countries and their capitals, and if you look at the vectors between those pairs, they're basically the same vectors in this embedding space. So this, this ability to machine learn an embedding of these words that captures some semantics is pretty, pretty interesting. And now, when you use your phone to try to translate, uh, those, those used to be based on sort of more on algorithms that were more traditional. Now, almost all of that is done with, uh, with machine learning. And you, uh, they train these things by giving them large bodies of text and, you know, and different languages. Sometimes they're paired, so it's like really the same sentence translated. Sometimes they're not even paired. It's just a big corpus of English, a big corpus of French, a big corpus of you know, Chinese and Korean, and, and it starts to learn how to translate uh, these, uh, these sentences. And what's interesting here is these lines are telling, uh, when the neural network was doing the translation, what words was it paying attention to? Um, to so it kind of knew, like, to get the tense right, which words did it need to pay attention to and things like that. So, so this is a really different type of, this looks very different from something like cat and dog images, right? Um, the, then one of the things, like more, more recent capabilities that really uh, got, you know, has created a huge amount of buzz has to, is goes under this broad term of generative models. So the idea here, these are some pictures, and the, you know, the idea is pictures of birds and ants and monasteries and volcanoes. And the thing that's happening here is these are not real pictures of birds and ants and monasteries and volcanoes. What happened is that you gave a neural network a whole bunch of images of volcanoes, and what it did is it essentially tried to learn the, what, what does the distribution of images of volcanoes look like, and then to be able to produce new images of volcanoes that are not real ones, but they look right. Okay, so when you look at these images, what you should think of is they, they're really one point in some very high dimensional space. So if you have, you know, 100 by, you know, or like, you know, say you have, you know, 10,000 pixels or something like that, um, and each pixel has, say, three colors associated to it, right, you have this sort of, you know, uh, what did I say, 10,000, you have this like 30,000 dimensional space, and each image is one point in that space, right? And so now you want to imagine what does the distribution of images in this 30,000 dimensional space look like? And that's what the neural network is learning, and then it's able to produce some new ones. So if you look at the pictures of the birds, though, they look a little funny, right? The heads are kind of out of proportion, uh, you know, the, some of the ants have, you know, too many legs, uh, you know, you see pictures of dogs with like two tails and things like that. And I guess the way I think of it is sort of like when my, my son and daughter were learning to draw, you know, at the very beginning, the you know, things are all out of proportion, they have too many legs and things, uh, but you know, you improve with time, right? So now these neural networks have kind of grown up, they've taken some art classes, and uh, so these are both not real people. These are, uh, you've shown these neural networks a bunch of pictures of celebrities and said, make me a picture of a new generic celebrity, and here are two of them. Um, and if you look at them very closely, I mean, the hair on this guy's face and like the light in her eyes and all the d details, they're like really just remarkably, you know, high fidelity. So this is the kind of thing that like makes you kind of wake up that like this is, something is happening here, right? We were at a, I think, I think it is legitimate to say that there is a revolution in artificial intelligence happening with these kinds of capabilities. Um, here's an example that's not images, but audio. 
um, that this model is not going to paint a picture for you. It's going to generate an, <coughs> an audio signal. And not only is it an audio signal, you get to tell it what you want it to say. Okay? You get to provide text input, and it's going to generate point by point an audio waveform. And I'm going to play it for you. So like that sounds like that sounds pretty incredible. I remember I played this for my wife and I was like, that is just mind blowing. And her response was, avocados aren't pear shaped. And I'm like, oh, you're missing it. It's so exciting. But the uh, um, but you can imagine as a physicist, there's lots of like time domain physics that we do. And you know, if you can model something this complicated at that fidelity with a, a neural network, then maybe these things can be useful. Okay. So the last example that I'm going to show on the machine learning, yes? Uh, yes. Yeah, and then there's a question of how, how actually, that's how they work. Uh, yeah, so I'll try to just, I'll explain a little bit how they work, but that's actually how they work. Um, that, I mean, that's how you train them in the first place. Um, okay, so the next thing that happened had to do with something that you know, kind of goes a little bit more into what people start to think of as artificial intelligence, which is playing the game of Go. So uh, you know, chess is something where computers started beating humans uh, you know, quite a while ago. Go is a vastly more complicated game to try to tackle. And uh, so a lot of people thought, like, you know, when, when, once computers can play Go better than humans, that will be a wa water mo moment. And, that's, and, and that's, what's, uh, that's what's happened recently. And what's interesting also is the, the begin this is shows basically the rating, you know, how good of a Go player are you as a function of time. And uh, the dotted lines here are like the, uh, you know, best human, uh, the, what is it? Uh, oh, no, these are, these are different uh, machine learning things. But the best human is somewhere around here. Um, and so that when, when these were first trained, they were trained on a huge corpus of historical Go matches and then a lot of, uh, you know, where they got to see how the, the best Go players in the world play and then try to learn those strategies uh, and then extend them by playing against itself many, many times. Uh, the newest version uh, doesn't even need that. You can stop, start from a blank slate and it will just play against itself many, many, many times and learn strategies. And, the, and the, the interesting thing is people that know Go very well say that some of the strategies are familiar and some of the strategies look kind of wildly unfamiliar. They don't look like how humans play. Um, so, it's, so that's very interesting. Um, but the one thing that this falls in, under the broad class of what's called reinforcement learning. And what you should think about here that's interesting is that it's an interactive kind of process, right? The, 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 the computer is going to look at the state of the board and decide what play to make. Then some, the opponent is going to make a, another play and then it's going to look at the state of the board and try to make another choice. So it's a, it's a sequential decision making that it has to do. And that involves sort of ideas of strategy and things like that. Um, and I'll come back to this example to, uh, a little bit later. <clears throat> okay, so, so now I'm going to switch to why should physicists care if you're still asleep? I mean, if you're still awake, you know? <laughs> um, and the way that I like to frame this is really kind of in the language of statistics, okay? It's going to be a statistical language, but I'm also going to try to give a lot of uh, physics examples so that it doesn't seem, so it also seems like, a, like I'm actually talking about physics, but the language of statistics is going to be kind of more convenient. Okay, so as physicists, what are the two big things that we do? Uh, I mean, on the very highest level, I'd say the two big things that we do is like kind of on the theory side is we make predictions. And roughly on the experimental side, we make, we, we, you know, we do experiments, we collect some data, and then we try to figure out what's going on, right? So if you think of like those two broad directions, um, the predictive side is uh, on the left side, I have the parameters, say, of my theory. Um, and these might have to do with, you know, masses of particles or coupling constants of some, you know, some system. Or, you know, uh, if you're doing condensed matter, it would it'd have to do with the, you know, the parameters in your Hamiltonian that describe how, you know, different lattice sites inter interact or something like that. Um, so you have parameters of your theory and you're trying to predict the observed data, right? Um, and then sometimes when, you're, when, when you talk about the observed data, the distribution for the observed data doesn't just depend on the parameters of the theory, it might also depend on details of your experiment, like calibration constants, various things like that, right? So these new, I'm calling them nuisance parameters, they're things that influence the distribution for the observed data, but they're not the things that you really care about in and of themselves. You're, you really care about doing inference on the parameters of interest usually. So 
so then you have, uh, you know, there are lots of different ways of thinking of it, but this predictive direction, uh, you can think of, oftentimes we have simulations that you give it the parameters of your theory and that you try to run a simulator to predict the distribution of your data. Um, sometimes people refer to that as the forward model. Um, and, uh, and then, and, and kind of mathematically, the interesting object is what I'm gonna, I'm gonna say the probability distribution for the data given, the vertical bar is given, the parameters of interest and the nuisance parameters. That's the statistical relationship between these different pieces. Um, and inside of your simulator, sometimes you have things that, uh, that statisticians call latent variables. They're just things that you don't get to observe, but you can think of them as sort of uh, happening inside. So at the part, and I'll give some examples later, but in particle physics, for instance, um, the thing that I observe is like energy deposits in my detector uh, what, what happened along the way was all sorts of particles decaying and scattering inside of my detector. I didn't get to observe those things, so those are my latent variables. And inside of my simulation, sometimes I can access those. Uh, and so sometimes in particle physics, we often refer to this as Monte Carlo truth. So if you imagine like having a simulation of how the solar system was formed, right now we only get to observe where the objects in the solar system are, but in that simulation, you would have been able to track their whole history of how they got there. Those would be the latent variables. Okay, so once you, you collect some observed data, then you wanna do, you wanna go the opposite direction. This is sometimes called an inverse problem or just uh, you know, measurement. I got some data, I wanna measure my parameter theta. Um, or uh, in the kind of statistical sense, you might just refer to this broadly as inference. I want to in infer the value of theta given my observations, okay? So this is the way that I'm gonna, this is the sort of formalism that I'm going to use, but I think, you know, basically every kind of physics that I can think about sort of can fit into this formalism. So some examples. Um, here is the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, the parameters of that theory are, you know, have to do with the fundamental parameters of cosmology. They predict the distribution of, you know, the, the CMB temperature fluctuations. Often we take these very complicated maps and then distill it down into a, a summary which is for basically a power spectrum. It's telling you how much power is there on different angular scales. Um, for particle physics, the, you know, the, uh, the theory of the standard model predicts what these collisions should look like. Um, and, uh, and so here's like the raw data, but as I discussed before, usually we don't work with the huge raw data. We distill it uh, to you know, some particular variable on the horizontal axis here that kind of characterizes this, uh, this complicated collision and sort of just a single number. And then we look at distributions of that number. Um, and here's a, it's kind of hard to see, but these are cosmological simulations that have to do with like dark matter clumping in the universe. Um, and the, you know, the, the, this, this uh, simulation basically just involves gravity, right? If you know how objects gravitate, you run a big in-body simulation, and then in the end you look at uh, sort of uh, statistical correlations and two-point functions and things on these maps, and that's what this sort of summary is. Okay, <clears throat> so now the question of why, going back to the question of why should we care, this is my very kind of high-level summary of I think why we should care as physicists. Um, and kind of as scientists more generally, is that many areas of science have simulations that are based on some very well-motivated mechanistic model. So that I just gave you three examples. I know kind of how, how the system should evolve. That's my physical model, um, and I can simulate things. And so I'm just like more generally, I'll call it a mechanistic model or a causal model for how things evolve. Um, but the aggregate effect of many interactions between these low-level components leads to an intractable inverse problem. Okay, so you can think of that, that, that story of the in-body simulation. I have this very simple rule for how two objects attract each other through gravity, but the full in-body simulation is super duper complicated, and if I just show you, showed you the output of one of these simulations, you wouldn't know like, what was used to produce it, right? That's the inverse problem. That's a very hard problem. So the developments in machine learning and artificial intelligence go way beyond kind of cat and dog classifiers, and they have the potential to effectively bridge what I'm calling the microscopic to macroscopic divide and aid in our ability to do these inverse problems. Okay, so, um, and so in particular, these machine learning models can provide some sort of effective statistical model for the macroscopic phenomena, the thing that you're observing, um, that are tied back to the low level microscop microscopic or kind of reductionist model. So you have this low-level description for how all the components of your system interact, and it's parameterized in terms of things that you care about, like 
uh, you know, the gravitational coupling constant or something like that. Um, and, but the aggregate effect of all those interactions is very complicated, and you would like to connect these two together. And, and in general, that's very hard, and these machine learning techniques are sort of uh, become, are offering us a new type of tool to connect these two together. And so these generative models, like I showed with the faces of the, of the celebrities, and another topic which I'll talk about called likelihood free inference, are two particularly exciting areas, I think, in this sort of, in this evolution. So now I'm just gonna flash a few more examples to try to get across the idea that I think this is like really pretty general. So, uh, you know, as physicists, you've probably, at some point dealt with the Ising model. You have a very simple system. It's just spin up or spin down. The interaction between the two spins, incredibly simple, right? Um, but the aggregate effect of the Ising model is complicated, and you know, it took a long time for people to figure out how to do, and you, you kind of figured out how to solve that particular case, but like that doesn't, those techniques don't necessarily work for other problems, right? Um, similarly, if I, if I wanted to think of a, a lattice type of situation in, in space time, where now I'm thinking about quantum mechanical fields, I might have something complicated like lattice QCD, when the quantum, you know, the quantum description of what's going on inside of the proton. This is an incredibly complicated thing, even though the, the rules for how everything interacts is very simple. Here's another example that is computational topography, okay? So this is a map of Taiwan, and here is some graphical illustration of a simulation that generates these kinds of topologies. And that simulation involves things like erosion, exhumation, I don't know, other things that I don't know about, uh, but you run these things, at, you run these simulations and you get maps that look like this. And so then your goal might be to try to find the values of the simulator so that the maps that it produced look like Taiwan, right? That's an inverse problem. Similarly, you can think about, for instance, how disease propagates through a population. You, for instance, start off with someone who's sick, uh, they, you know, they forget to wash their hands after going to the bathroom, they cough on some people, uh, you know, someone goes to the bar and eats the nuts or something, and the, you know, the, the disease propagates through the population. And it's very easy to come up with a very simple mechanistic model for how the disease populates from person to person, but the way the disease populates through the population is very complicated. And these are just very kind of various kinds of plots for like networks of how diseases populate depending on the nature of the disease and uh, you know, all these kinds of things. It looks very complicated, right? But you know, writing simulators for them is actually pretty easy. Um, so I'm going to go into some more detail into like the particle physics example. And in our case, you know, we start off with the standard model of particle physics, which you know, is written in the language of quantum field theory. You can take the, these equations and you can get the kind of famous Feynman diagrams, which are sort of a systematic approximation of, of this theory. And this I can think of as basically telling me the probability that you know, certain kinds of particles interact with each other and, and so that these outgoing particles have certain energies and momenta. Um, this is the kind of thing that you can calculate on it with a pencil and paper. Um, but then that's not the end of the story. If you have things like quarks and gluons, they radiate more quarks and gluons and you get this more complicated thing. And this is not something you can write down on a pencil and paper anymore. So at this point you're transitioning onto computer simulations. And then at the end of this stage, the stuff on the outside are like stable particles, like pions and stuff like that, or they're flying into your detector. And then I have to you know, simulate the interaction of those things with my detector. And at that point, I have like a big you know, uh, model of the geometry of my detector, keeping track of individual screws and if they're made out of copper or iron and all this kind of stuff. So this is definitely not pencil and paper work either. And the output of this is you know, 100 million that, uh, electronic sensors and the energy deposits on them. Um, and then finally, we run some kind of algorithms on that data to try to summarize the data into something more manageable. But this is sort of the chain. This is our simulation chain. We have code to do all of that, uh, but this is clearly like a, you know, this is a complicated forward model, right? Now, conceptually, if I just focus on, for instance, the detector piece of it, uh, what is the detector simulation doing? You know, conceptually, it's telling you what is the probability distribution for the detector response given some incoming particles. So if you, if you, if you had exactly the same incoming particles and you ran the detector simulation 100 times, you get 100 different outputs. So it's defining a probability distribution. The way that they work is through what's called Monte Carlo. And if you know a little bit about Monte Carlo, you can think of it as an integration. So it's integrating over all the microphysics that's happening inside of my detector, all the scatterings and things like that. So simulating one collision at the LHC involves doing an integral over like 100 million uh, uh, latent variables, 
Okay, so that integral is very, very complicated. So as a consequence, the evaluation of the likelihood, if you just gave me an event from the LHC and said, what's the likelihood that you got this particular event, I can't answer that question for you. That's like a totally intractable problem. But I can simulate it and I can give you a bunch of examples. So this motivates basically a new class of inference algorithms that are called li under the name likelihood-free inference which only require the ability to generate samples from the simulation in the forward mode. So this is something that all over science people know how to do. If you have a simulator and you can run it and you can generate a bunch of examples, uh, then you should be able to do inference. And so this likelihood-free inference is like a paradigm for phrasing the problem, uh, which I think, it, which I like a lot because it's very portable about being able to talk to people in different domains and different fields, because it's like a framework for talking about the problem that's not so like specific to like particle physics. Okay, but if you're paying attention, then you might ask, well, you know, why hasn't this stopped us thus far, right? We discovered the Higgs is the same problem, so why did it work? Well, the, the main reason is that the, from the very complicated detector um, uh, output, which has, you know, the huge number of uh, electronic sensors, we kind of knew what the right variable to look for was. We knew that we could take all of these energy deposits and, and summarize it into one number, which is this, that, this axis that's called the invariant mass, um, and, and then look at that, the histogram of that one number for a bump, and that's what we found. But if you, didn't ha if you didn't have the insight to know that this is the good variable to plot, like what are you gonna do, right? Or if there isn't such one variable that's gonna summarize everything that you need, what are you gonna do, right? And the problem is that this approach of making histograms where you run the simulation many, many, many times you, and you make a histogram, that's what the red is, is a histogram, say, of running the simulation a whole bunch of times and that's making an approximation for what this probability, function, uh, probability distribution looks like. Um, that's not gonna work if X is high dimensional. If, you, if X is 100 dimensional, you're not gonna be filling a 100 dimensional histogram anytime soon. So what do you do? Um, and this is a real case. And the, now that we've discovered the Higgs, like this plot worked for discovering the Higgs, but now we've discovered the Higgs, we're looking for, for subtle deviations from what the standard model predicts. And so in the, uh, so if you look, so these are these diagrams, this is supposed to be a Higgs that's decaying into some other particles that decay into some other particles. There are all these angles that you might consider. Um, it's a complicated mess. And these are distributions of those angles in, uh, under different uh, hypotheses for how you, it, this Higgs, one of them is the standard model Higgs, and the other ones are uh, cases that are not the standard model Higgs. And, uh, and you see that you know, there's all sorts of information in all these variables. So you would really like to be able to work with a higher dimensional representation of the data where the signal for new physics is maybe hiding in some correlations of, between all these things. And, and you can't do this with the previous approach. Um, now, just to try to hammer home again that this is not like, uh, I'm not the only person talking about this, uh, there's been a series of workshops uh, that were uh, addressing this likelihood-free problem, and I'm just gonna uh, 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 read off some of the information from the web pages for them. So ABC is one particular type of algorithm for doing this likelihood-free inference, okay? And it says, <coughs> this you know, website keeps track of these developments uh, for likelihood-free inference a class of computational statistical methods for inference under intractable likelihoods, right? That's, what I, that's the way that I'm trying to formula, formulate it. Here you see it says, likelihood free inference methods have been developed mostly beyond the radar of the machine learning community. So this is com not coming from machine learning people, it's coming from scientists. It says, but are important tools from large diverse segment of the scientific community, in particular it's true for systems and population biology, computational neuroscience, computer vision, healthcare science, and many others. So, um, so this is interesting, you note that, you know, particle physics is not on the list, right? So like that was like personally a problem for me um, and because uh, and particle physics definitely falls into this class. Um, and, uh, and so I was invited to give a keynote talk at the big machine learning conference uh, now called NeurIPS. Um, and uh, so this was in Barcelona in 2016 and I talked about uh, likelihood free inference and particle physics. And if anything positive came out of this meeting, it's now when machine learning people talk about this problem, they say um, that they're used in particle physics to <laughs> generate uh, high energy processes. So we've, we've, crea we've, gone, we've, we've gone into the mainstream uh, of machine learning now. So, uh, but again, you see this thing that's saying several real, real world phenomena are better described by simulators 
that do not admit a tractable density. So again, people are just saying over and over again, simulators, high fidelity description of what's going on, but you can't use them for normal statistical inference. And then they start saying this is related to a bunch of buzzwords, and all of these are like super hot topics in machine learning, okay? So there's a very high level meta point that I wanna make here, which is that you know, when you think about the budgets of say particle physics or other you know, parts of physics, a lot of this has to do with our perceived value for society, right? And uh, you know, you know, in general, bioinformatics doing pretty well. Um, and uh, so I think it behooves us as a field to try to make these connections uh, about how the way that we analyze data can be broadly you know, applicable to other kinds of fields and also tie into all of the you know, excitement that's going on around machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about two different classes of doing this likelihood free inference and how you might actually solve this problem. Um, there are two broad approaches and I'm, not, I'm only gonna talk about uh, sort of one. So one of the approaches when you try to do inference, you really just really use the simulator, but you have to use the simulator in a very clever way. And so the, the, the approaches for using this, the, the approaches that under this category are things like approximate Bayesian computation that I mentioned before. There's something called probabilistic programming, which is pretty cool. And then there are other kinds of techniques. And then the other approach, which I'm gonna talk about more, uh, is that you use the simulator and then you, you run the simulator a lot and then you use a neural network to essentially approximate what the simulator is doing. And then you use the neural network for, for uh, for doing statistical inference. So there are a few different approaches to this. One of them is this generative adversarial networks. That's the approach that made the pictures of the, of the uh, celebrities and things like that. There's another approach right here, uh, which is the one I'm gonna go into in some more detail right now. And then uh, these other ones I'm not gonna talk about. Okay, <clears throat> so let me uh, switch to talking about one specific uh, approach. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna, the preamble to this approach is just to remind you about simple hypothesis testing, okay? The kind of thing that you hopefully learned about at some point in high school, uh, you know, where you, th you think about, uh, this is like the you know, classic hypothesis testing setup, okay? So you have, in this situation, you have two hypotheses. In my little drawing here, my data is just one dimensional. So the two Gaussians are the distribution of the data for the two hypotheses. The left hypothesis is the null hypothesis, the right is the alternative hypothesis, and, uh, and so you have, uh, so this table kind of keeps track of the actual condition. You can think of it as like guilty or not guilty if you want, um, and you're going to do a test of the data, and you're gonna make a decision, and you're going to either accept the null or reject the null, right? You're gonna claim a discovery or not claim a discovery, or in this table it's sort of like say that the person is guilty or not say that the person is guilty, right? And, um, and in that sort of two by two table, there are two things where you do the right thing. The person is guilty and you say they're guilty. The person's not guilty and you say they're not guilty. And then the two types of mistakes you can make. They're often referred to as like false positives and false negatives uh, or type one and type two error. Um, and uh, so this is just kind of the general setup for doing hypothesis testing, right? And um, so in this one dimensional problem, it's kind of very easy. You're, gonna, you're going to uh, make some threshold and everything to the right of this, you're gonna, you're gonna claim as a positive, and everything to the left, you're gonna claim as like a negative, and, uh, and then you adjust this threshold to have the properties that you want. So as you adjust this, this threshold, the trade-off between the true positive rate and the false positive rate follows some curve, and then you adjust it. And usually what people do, you know, is when you talk about like a 95% chance or something like that, when you do drug tests, or like blood tests and things like that, it's all about adjusting this so that the rate of type one error is some particular number, like 5%. Okay, now in the one dimensional problem, it's very simple. But in the two dimensional problem, or higher dimensional problems, it's less obvious. So let's say that the blue and the red are the two different hypotheses, and, the, and, the, and the, my, my data is two dimensional. And so I have a bunch of blue dots and a bunch of red dots, and they're the same in these three examples. The blue dots are the same, the red dots are the same. The question is, how am I going to like make a region of the data where I, I accept the null hypothesis, or how am I gonna find a region of the data where I reject the null hypothesis and I, and I claim a discovery, you know? Um, there's, here are three different possible ways to do it, right? Uh, so w what is my rule for choosing which one of these is the best? And in case this seems too abstract, let's try, put it into context. Uh, here are some examples of hypothesis testing. You gotta choose between your decision is going to be, I'm gonna eat this thing, okay? 
And either it's a chihuahua or it's a muffin, right? And you, what you want to do is eat as many muffins as possible while controlling the rate at which you eat chihuahuas, right? And you probably want the rate at which you eat chihuahuas to be very small. If you made it be zero, you don't get to have any muffins, right? So life's complicated. All right, so, the, uh, so what are you gonna do? And in this situation, you don't have any idea what the, you know, like what the likelihood of, of chihuahuas looks like. You just have a bunch of examples of you know, fried chicken and labradoodles, right? So how do you solve this problem, right? Well, if you, the, the, there's a classical solution to this problem, which is what you want to do uh, to define this region is make a contour of the likelihood ratio. So you're saying, what's the likelihood that this observation came from my alternate? which is say, you know, uh, muffins over the probability that this image came from uh, my null hypothesis, which is, uh, you know, chihuahuas, right? And so you, and then you adjust this threshold uh, to, uh, uh, and, and that, that procedure will be the thing that will allow you to eat as many muffins as possible while eating as few chihuahuas as possible. Okay, so the problem with this approach, this is, so this is motivating the likelihood ratio as the best solution to this problem. Uh, the, the problem with this approach is that you can't evaluate this unless you know the likelihood uh, of th that this image is a chihuahua. And that, and that whole likelihood free inference story that I told you, that's exactly the thing you don't know. Okay, so how, you can't use this as the guiding principle for solving this problem. So what are you gonna do? Um, so this is where machine learning comes in. Um, and the way that I like to explain machine learning to physicists is, in, is, uh, machine, is to think of machine learning as applied calculus of variations. So uh, for calculus of variations, I like this example. You can ask like, here's two hoops, there's a soap bubble between them, and you're asking the question, you know, what's, what shape is the soap bubble going to take, right? And the, and the idea is it's going to try to minimize, you know, the surface area, right? So the, uh, um, so you, and, uh, and so the, the calculus of variations is the mathematical tool that you use to try to find a function that minimizes some quantity or some functional, right? So, so let's think about this problem in the kind of calculus of variations like language. So I've got red dots and blue dots. This is a different example. Uh, here's another example, red dots and blue dots. And the only thing I have are a bunch of examples, okay? <clears throat> now, what I would like to do is, try, is to try to find some function that's gonna take an input x, okay, that's my dot, like the location of my dot, and it's going to try to put an output y, where uh, y is, uh, should be one if it comes from a blue dot, I'll call that signal, and zero if it comes from a red dot, and I'll call that background. So if you could make a function that did this perfectly, you would be, you would be done, okay? The problem is that if these distributions overlap, there's, I'm never gonna be able to do that, right? I'm never gonna be able to find a function that's going to not make any mistakes. So I've got a, I, there's a trade-off that I have to deal with. So let's think of some example function that's going to uh, codify that trade-off for the different kinds of mistakes I can make. So in this example, I'm gonna read this off. This is just, a, a, just you know, I haven't motivated this. I'm just gonna consider this, this loss uh, uh, functional, okay? <coughs> Where I'm going to say, this is an expectation. There's two terms, there's two expectations. The first one is saying, if my data came from the null hypothesis, so that's the blue, oh, sorry, the red dots. If my data came from the red dots, I want S to give me zero, and if it gets me, gives me anything other than zero, that's bad, and I'm gonna penalize it. So it's that difference squared. And then, you know, conversely, if, if, uh, if X came from a uh, blue dot, um, then I want S to give me one, and if it gives me anything different, I'm gonna penalize it by that difference squared, okay? So this is something I can just consider. Here's a, a, a particular way of doing a trade-off between the different types of mistakes. And now, and I, I, I can't actually perform this integral if I'm in the likelihood-free setting, because I don't know what this, you know, I don't know what the likelihood is, but I can still write it out symbolically. Now, okay, so here's my, this loss functional, and now I can, and what I want to do is find the function s that minimizes this thing, that minimizes these types of mistakes, and here you can, you know, dust off your calculus of variation skills, do your Euler-Lagrange equations, and you find that the function s that minimizes that is this quantity here, okay? Um, and, uh, and what's interesting is that this quantity is, uh, has, is the same contours, it's a one-to-one -one transformation of the likelihood ratio. So this is basically equivalent to learning the likelihood ratio. Okay, so if I can find the s that minimizes this, it's basically the same thing as, uh, as solving the likelihood ratio problem, but the problem is how do I do it, right? Because I don't know how to do these integrals. But here's the kind of trick, 
is that these integrals, these are integrals of some probability distribution. I can approximate them with Monte Carlo integrals, right? So I can approximate this function if I can sample from my simulator. So as long as I can run my simulator and get samples from the two hypotheses, then I can approximate this thing by just uh, uh, taking this difference where if the samples came from one, I give you know, y i is one, and if it came from the other, y i is zero. And so I can effectively approximate this thing. And now my goal is to try to find a function s that, that minimizes this thing. And how am I gonna do that? Well, I don't wanna do like real, like consider all possible functions and try to use calculus. I'm gonna be like more like an engineer. So I'm going to think of a very flexible family of functions that are parametrized by, you know, uh, what did I write, phi. Okay, so, uh, and, and then I'm going to uh, minimize that function with respect to phi. So, and that's exactly what neural networks are. Neural networks are essentially just some plug-in, very flexible, fun you know, class of functions, and then you, and they have a bunch of parameters, and I minimize that loss function with respect to those parameters, and I, and I approximate the solution to this problem. And the nice part is that all of that is operationally doable, uh, as long, even in the situation where all I can do is sample from my simulator. So once you do that, you, you sample from your simulator, you optimize this neural network with respect to that, you, you know, try to minimize that loss function that I showed you, you get something that approximates this, uh, you kind of uh, do a transformation to make it be like the likelihood ratio, and you're basically done, okay? Um, and then this idea, you can also, uh, that only works when you have two hypotheses, like cats and dogs. But what if I want to do statistical inference for a theory that has a, a bunch of parameters? Like I want to know the Higgs mass, or I want to know, uh, you know, like the cosmological, you know, uh, parameters of, uh, of the concordance cosmo cosmology model or something. So if you have a theory that has some parameters theta, you can do the same idea, but you replace H naught and H1 as being, instead of being specific hypotheses, you just think of them as being two points in the parameter space of your theory. So now instead of having a function S that only depends on X, your observed data, you have a function that depends on X and the parameters of your theory, the null and the alternate hypothesis that you're trying to compare. So this is something that, we, that I introduced a while back and I call these things parametrized classifiers. It's not one classifier, it's like a continuous family of classifiers that's parametrized by the, the points in your theory space that you want to test. Okay, great. So now if you can do this, life looks good. And so this is schematically the story that I told you. You have a, a theory that has some parameters. You, ha you have implemented it in some simulation. You can run your simulation. It outputs some, uh, some uh, fake examples x. I'm going to have a neural network that takes an x and the value of those parameters, and it's going to output some number. And then I've constructed for you a loss function so that when you optimize it, uh, you get the, the function that you end up you know, learning is a good approximation of the likelihood ratio. And that li likelihood ratio depends on the parameters the unknown parameters that you're trying to infer. Um, and so then, so you can't evaluate this unless you assume some particular values of the parameters, but when you go to actually make your plot to say like, I'm making a measurement of like my Higgs boson mass and, or my some, you know, whatever plot that you wanna make of your, of your, the inference for your, the parameters of your theory, at that time you know how to evaluate this thing and then you can do the kind of typical chi-square type plots and things like that and you can do inference. So this is a pipeline that basically scales to high dimensions and only, allow, only requires that you can run the simulation in the forward mode. So this was some work that we did, you know, like a couple of years ago, and then recently we realized that we can kind of make it a, a fancier version of this because we realized that there are some things in the simulation that we can extract other than just having it output uh, fake observations. And so I won't go into the details of this, but basically it's like, once you run the simulation and you have one particular realization of running your whole simulation, you can ask the question, would this, have, would this particular you know, example have been more or less likely if I changed the parameters of my theory? And, and, and that's something that's tractable. And so, uh, so this kind of augmented data, you can include into this loss function and find loss functions so that when you minimize it, you still get a good approximation of the likelihood ratio and, uh, and that works better. So to give you a feel, this axis right here is basically how accurately are we approximating a likelihood function where the data in this example is 42 dimensional. Okay, so it's pretty high dimensional data. Um, zero means we're doing a perfect job of approximating the likelihood function and you know, up is bad. And then this is as a function of the training sample size. So how many times do we have to run the simulator to create training data? 
And this uh, yellow line is kind of the traditional approach that doesn't use any neural networks. So before, what we saw was that if with large training sample sizes, like a million or 10 million training examples, we could do better than the traditional approach. Um, so that's doable, but it's computationally expensive. And now with these new techniques, uh, with as few as 10,000 examples, we can do much better. So we've made this thing like, you know, this is a logarithmic scale. So we've made the thing, you know, drastically more sample efficient. And so we can get very accurate estimates of the likelihood ratio, even for very complicated uh, uh, data. And so in the context of the Higgs, where the, here's some example Feynman diagram where you're making a Higgs boson, the red dots basically mean new physics is happening. Uh, and the, that new physics is going to modify the distributions of how all those particles fly out. And uh, we work with, a, okay, a 42-dimensional observation. Um, and, uh, and this is how well we're you know, estimating the true likelihood very, very well. And when you turn that into the physics reach of the LHC, this is a plot, this axis is basically uh, how much new physics, where zero means no new physics, that's the standard model. Any other point is sort of, you know, some amount of new physics is happening. And then this is a, like a likelihood curve. So, uh, so the bottom of this is like the best fit point, and then this is, you know, not an agreement. And, and so the steeper this is, the more accurate your measurement is. And, what we're, and so the, our new approach with machine learning is the red dotted line compared to the yellow dotted line, and that uh, translates to basically adding like 90% more LHC data. And this is one of the, like the flagship measurements for the LHC is to study the, the Higgs in detail and see if there's any signs of new physics. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so this was kind of the first big chapter. This is the, basically the only example I'm gonna be able to really kind of get into some more details on. Um, and now I'm gonna kind of zoom, start to zoom back out and kind of give you some other, uh, some other feels of things that are going on. So this is kind of a little dummy example that I call active sciencing. Um, and it relates to uh, uh, this, this story about uh, the game of Go. So in the game of Go, you're, you're using this reinforcement learning uh, technique. And the way that <coughs> reinforcement learning is usually described is something like this. You have a, your agent as your, 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 you know, your, your computer algorithm that's trying to play Go, um, it's going to, uh, it's going to uh, you know, look at the state of the, of the situation, you know, look at the board that you're in now, and decide to make some action. And so once it makes that action, it's gonna interact with the environment, that's like putting a piece down on the board, and then something's gonna happen, okay, uh, which is like the other person makes a move, right? And, uh, and then based on the, the new state of the situation, you need to kind of interpret this and like, do, is this, do I think I'm in a better situation or a worse situation? Like, am I in a stronger case or not? So the agent will get some sort of reward and then, uh, and then look at the new state and then you just sit in a loop, right? In some cases, you might not get the reward until the end of the game, like when you find out if you won or not, right? So sometimes the reward is very sparse. Sometimes you have a lot of feedback as you're interacting with the environment. So this kind, of, this kind of loop is very similar actually to like the scientific method in the sense that you can think of the agent as like some experimentalist or some kind of scientist who's, you know, in the state is basically the state of nature, right? So you have a current understanding of the state of nature. Uh, you you're, you want to figure out what experiment to do. The action you're going to do is decide what experiment to do next. So then you go do that experiment. That's interacting with the environment, right? You create, you, you, you perform the experiment. You gather some more data. Based on that, you're going to interpret the data. That's like statistical analysis. And then based on that updated situation, uh, you're going to like figure out what to do next, right? And you just sit in that loop and you, uh, and you try to learn as much as you can about the universe. So as a proof of principle, I use this kind of likelihood free inference uh, technique that I sh uh, told you about, and I provided it a simulator. And my goal in this situation was to try to just measure one parameter of the standard model. Okay, I have a simulation for some collision. There's electrons and positrons running into each other with muons flying out. And, uh, and my goal is to try to measure the Weinberg angle. And I kind of know that I can do that. Uh, but the thing that I would like to know is if I could figure out what experiment to do next. So if I'm gonna do that, I need to kind of think of a class of experiments that I might perform. And in this situation, the, the, the way that I sort of thought of the types of experiments I could perform was just in terms of the center of mass energy of my collider and if the beams were polarized or not, okay? And if you are a graduate student in particle physics, you should know the answer to this question. And the answer to this question kind of is over here. This is the physics plot that there's a particular nice variable that you can plot called the forward backward asymmetry. And as you scan the center of mass energy, what you see is that there's no effect if you run right at the Z boson mass, 
And if you run just a little above or a little below the Z boson mass, uh, you get an interference effect and you, you see something. But, uh, and if you run too far away, it, you, the, you, know, you don't really get anything anymore because uh, this is all about, uh, so there's some sort of interference effect which is sort of like driving an, an, uh, an oscillator, right? You're, you're sweeping through a resonance here and you wanna be just a little bit off resonance. So in the algorithm that I, you know, that I put together, it imagines running lots of possible experiments, does the inference algorithm, and looks to see what experiment am I gonna learn the most from. And here's this plot of the expected information gain as a function of the center of mass energy, and you see that around 90 GeV, right here, I'm not gonna learn anything. My expected information gain is, you know, is kind of consistent with zero, but just above or, just above or below uh, the Z boson mass, I'm gonna learn a lot. And so this algorithm is really like automating the process of like what experiment should I do next. So this I think is kind of, you know, it's a very toy example, but it's kind of interesting because you start seeing how machine learning techniques could start to be like in the loop of trying to predict, you know, you know what experiments to do next. Okay, um, I'm definitely going slowly at the cost of trying to be, I mean, trying to be clear at the cost of going slowly, but that's okay. Um, so I'm gonna talk now a little bit about these generative models. So these, this predictive direction that happens, uh, everything I was talking about before was about inference. Let's talk about this predictive direction. Um, so the, we talked about you know, this p examples of making images of volcanoes and birds and things like that. Um, and the question is sort of how does that work? Um, roughly what happens is you start off with a lot of random numbers, okay? And that's like the kind of random noise here. And that is the input to your neural network. And the neural network takes those random numbers and does some kind of strange, you know, nonlinear transformation to it, such that the output of the neural network is, is formatted like an image. And the goal of it is to find a neural network that's gonna take random noise, which is a distribution, and reshape it to look like the distribution of images. In the, so then you can think of the neural network as kind of like a counterfeiter. If you've ever seen this uh, Catch Me If You Can movie, Leo is a, is a counterfeiter. And, uh, and he's trying to make images that are gonna fool you, right? And, and Tom over here is, is the detective that's looking at real money and counterfeit money and trying to tell the difference between them. And if, if Tom can tell the difference between them, that's bad, right? So Leo wants to continue improving fooling Tom, and Tom wants to continue getting better and better at telling the difference between the real money and the counterfeit money. And so you can think of it as like it's an adversarial relationship that these two people have, and you can set it up as like a mini-max game and, and, uh, and, the, and, and, it, and so this mini-max game has a, a sort of a saddle point to it. One person's trying to maximize it, the other person's trying to minimize it, um, and there's a Nash equilibrium here, and the Nash equilibrium of this system has the property that it is the true distribution of like volcanoes. Okay, so this is a way of like operationalizing this thing, and so you can train a neural network, and that's why they're called adversarial networks, and you can uh, try to learn the distributions of of celebrity faces or whatever. Now this generative model is conceptually doing the same thing as my detector simulation. My detector simulation also takes a bunch of random numbers and outputs things that look like you know, physics, uh, but it's hand-coded, right? It's, it's coded by hand uh, and it uh, has all the physics inside, uh, but it's also very, very slow, right? So one thing that we're uh, investigating just for computational reasons is can we learn the simulator and replace it with a neural network that's like you know, 100,000 times faster to run? Um, that would save our computing budgets a lot. So there's been work to try to do that, uh, and these are some examples of, in the particle physics context. This is one in the, in the cosmology context. And so there's a lot of work to try to do that, but in these situations, you're basically trying to learn the simulation. Um, there's some other examples that come in the, in the context of cosmology where the, uh, the top row here are real images of galaxies, and the bottom row are examples uh, where you've <coughs> generated some fake galaxies. And so uh, the situation here, you're not using a simulator because people don't have a good simulator for what the galaxies should look like. So what's, what's going on here? The idea is that you can collect real images of galaxies with your telescopes, uh, the, but the problem is you want to use those galaxies to try to do some sort of weak lensing survey to try to learn about cosmological parameters. And, these, and getting these images is expensive. Um, so when people try to build these weak lensing surveys, they need to calibrate them the surveys are very complicated pipeline on the data to try to estimate the cosmological parameters. And if you want to calibrate it, you want to pump a bunch of data through it and see what happens. 
But where are you going to get that data from, right? That data is very expensive to collect. So here's an example where if you could use a generative model to learn the distribution of what galaxies look like and make a bunch of fake galaxies that have the right properties, then you could use them to calibrate this whole pipeline, and that's kind of the motivation here. So I think that's pretty interesting. Okay. Um, so then there's a section which I don't have a ton of time to say, uh, to talk about, but I'll just say that it's not lost on me that, you know, this all sounds great and all, but, you know, I know when I talk to physicists, there are a lot of lingering concerns. And so I just picked a few of them that are common. You know, one is just the worry that it feels very much like a black box. And, you know, how do I interpret what's going on inside? Or how do I check what's going on inside? Um, how do, there, you know, a lot of experimentalists are worried that the neural network is sort of finding some correlation and leveraging some correlation that's not meaningful or trustworthy. And how do I know it's not doing that? And how do I protect against it? Um, there's also the issue that if you're training these things with simulations, you know the simulations may be good, but it's not perfect. So how do you handle the mismodeling between the simulation and the real data? Um, so these are like questions that people take very seriously, and it's the bulk of the research now is really trying to address those kinds of questions. And I'm just going to like flash a few random things uh, with the time that I have, but I put it kind of broadly under the, the category of what I call physics-aware machine learning. Okay. And so just to hammer home that this is an important thing, Max Welling is like a very, very well-known machine learning researcher. Uh, interestingly, he was the graduate student of, at Hooft. Um, but uh, uh, so, and he has this slide that's basically, within machine learning, there's sort of two different approaches, broad approaches. They, ref, they go under the names of discriminative or generative. And the generative side here includes, for instance, simulation models. And they have the nice properties of, for instance, allowing us to inject expert knowledge, uh, modeling causal relationships, being interpretable, being data efficient, being robust to uh, what I would call uh, systematic uncertainties. These are the properties we want, right? On the other side, um, you have uh, discriminative models, which include most deep learning techniques. So this, this worry that physicists have is not lost on the machine learning community. People are aware of that. And so there's, so what, you know, what are the advantages of the deep learning approach? Well, part of it is that it's just very, very successful in some cases, but it's usually kind of restricted to when you have large training samples and, and lots of super, you know, you can do supervised learning with lots of training. But these are properties that we would like, right? So the goal is how do we put these two things together, and there's some inter intersection here, which is like a very exciting forefront of research, and uh, I don't have time to really go into some details, but I'll just flash a few things. So <clears throat> one is a, there's a class of machine learning models that people were using for doing uh, climate modeling. So this is CO2 levels on, Mauna, on Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea, and the important part here is that, you know, you're modeling a fairly complicated distribution, I mean, uh, you know, not distribution, but, you know, in time series, and it has lots of different effects. There's a gradual trend, there's a periodic thing that's annual, there's a, a residual from that that tells you about like El Ninos and things like that, and then there's just instrumental noise. And the nice part about this type of machine learning model is it allows you to kind of tell a story of all the different pieces and, and, and compose them together kind of like a narrative. Um, and so you literally have a grammar uh, for how to put together this vocabulary of of physic, you know, me, you know, physically interpretable components to make this machine learning model. And after you do the fit, you can read off the different pieces and, and see what's going on. So this is under the, 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 the title of Gaussian processes. Um, in the particle physics side, we've been using Gaussian processes to model some things where the, the machine learning model has interpretable pieces like there's Poisson fluctuations, there's mass resolution effects, there's calibration problems, parton density functions. Like I can interpret all of these as physicists. And on the neural network side, there's been some approaches to try to make neural networks where the topology of the neural network is actually given to you from some physics algorithm. And these have some nice kind of interpretable properties, which I, I don't really have time to go into. Uh, but there's a lot of work about trying to kind of get the best of both worlds. Um, on jet physics side, I'll say that there's been some work about making uh, generative models. So your goal is not to make a celebrity face. It's to make one of these very complicated objects that's called a jet which is a big spray of particles that hit your detector and all, the, you know, all this complicated stuff. And the thing is that we have a simulation for this, but it's very uh, complicated. If you did the approach that I was talking about these, these generative adversarial networks, that machine, that neural network doesn't know any physics. But here's an approach where the neural network is structured in the same way that the, what we call the parton shower is. So it has an interpretable structure. And after you train it, 
in addition to it making jets that look realistic, you can also go inside and look at uh, various things in the sort of latent part of the process to say, like, if I, if I thought about, you know, some quark is going along and radiates off a gluon, uh, does the, is the angle between the gluon and the quark right? And so here's a plot of looking and probing inside of the neural network. That's the red curve. And then probing inside the blue curve is probing inside of our traditional scientific simulator. And so we can identify the same piece of physics and we can check that the distribution is actually correct. So this is interpretable and basic and you know, much, much faster and, uh, and sort of has lots of advantages associated to it. Okay, um, and then the, since I know time is long, I'll just say that these kinds of discussions are going on all over the place. There have been a bunch of workshops recently uh, at the NeurIPS, uh, uh, you know, sort of about a year and a half ago, we had a workshop focusing on deep learning for the physical sciences. You see things about gravitational waves, neutrinos, neutrino experiments here, uh, neutrino-less double beta decay experiments. Uh, this is Ice Cube looking for super high energy neutrinos. Um, there's stuff that's going on in terms of uh, uh, you know, uh, graph synthesis for, for you know, chemistry, uh, quantum chemistry, where you're doing density functional theory and you're trying to approximate that, and stuff that has to do with condensed matter physics, uh, you know, particle physics examples. Uh, quantum mini body physics is an area that's incredibly active right now. Many of the people that are doing this are at the March meeting. There's whole sections devoted to this right now. Uh, people modeling you know, uh, complicated quantum mini body systems using neural networks. Um, we just had a couple weeks ago uh, uh, at, uh, at, in Santa Barbara a workshop and then, a, well, this is a long program and a week-long workshop all about uh, basically machine learning and physics. So it's, a, it's become a, like a, it's an exploding as an area and there are lots of examples that have, where you see lots of nice uh, success. So, um, yeah, I don't know if it's really necessary to say all of this again, but basically I think that, I don't think that it's all hype. I mean, I think as physicists, we should come with a skeptical attitude, but I think there's really is a, a lot of, uh, of uh, potential for this to really change how we approach physics. And, uh, and, uh, <coughs> and I'm very excited to see sort of where it goes from here. So thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, so if, 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 if you're trying to, in, the, in these generative networks, you give it uh, a bunch of examples of data from some source, and what it will try to do is learn the distribution of the data that came from that source. So if that, that source of data is experimental dis data, it will just learn what the experimental data looks like, um, and, uh, which is kind of a weird thing. You know, you can generate some, some fake experimental data, and is that useful or not? I don't know, it depends on your, your setting, right? So in the example that I gave of the galaxies, that was real experimental data, and uh, you learned kind of the distribution of what galaxies look like, and you generated some more fake galaxies, and that was useful because they had a reason to need that, which had to do with calibrating the, the sort of uh, analysis pipeline. And the, in the particle physics example, we're not trying to usually learn the, the, uh, that distribution on real experimental data, we're trying to learn uh, the, the distribution from the simulator. So the input to the network is actually simulated data. And then you can say, well, why do that? You already have a simulator. And you, there would be no point in doing it other than the simulator takes, uh, you know, like 15 minutes to run for one event. And the neural network takes like, you know, 0.2 seconds, right? So if you can do, uh, so if you can generate many, many more samples much quicker, then it's worthwhile. But then you want to check to make sure that it's like really describing the distributions well. Because if it's not, then you're going to, it's going to have all sorts of knock-on consequences. Did I, did I answer your question? <clears throat> yeah, so, yeah, so that's a, a good question. So the, there's kind of a how you think about uncertainty issue. Um, uh, I think we're often taught in our undergraduate labs to think of, I made a measurement and that measurement has some uncertainty. Um, uh, I personally think that the observed data doesn't have any uncertainty, it's just what it is. And that what you mean when you talk about uncertainty is like, uh, there's some underlying thing that you would actually like to estimate 
and how accurately to, am I estimating it, right? And so in that sense, I think it's almost always better to think of there being a distribution for that quantity. And so, this, so what you're doing is you're trying to learn the distribution of that quantity. So, uh, so I think of each individual instance as just an instance and doesn't have any error, and my goal is to learn the whole distribution, which is a much more sophisticated, sophisticated way of talking about the uncertainty. Uh -huh. <coughs> um, I, I didn't hear part of the question. I heard the part about uh, there's like kind of statistics and linear algebra, um, and that you should know that. And then there's, but th but you, the end. Your question was. Oh, I mean, th there's the, you know, there's a lot of uh, n semantics and naming issues going on, right? A lot of machine learning stuff uh, you can just think of as optimization, or you can, uh, you know, like reinforcement learning, you can think of as, you know, like a, like, con you know, like a, uh, you know, expert control, and like, you know, there's a lot of like just renaming of things. A lot of the machine learning stuff that we, that I've talked about, physicists invented a long time ago, and they thought of it in terms of free energy. And variational, you know, like variational inference is just another thing of what people talk about when they do variational problems with free energy. So there's a lot of just kind of renaming stuff, uh, uh, and and you know people can get into arguments about is this new or is it all hype and 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 like about the what you call things, right? Uh, I personally, that's why I describe machine learning as like applied calculus of variations because it's like a language as physicists that I think we're more familiar with, and it kind of tries to take away some of the hype. Um, at the same time. Those techniques that we've developed that we know a lot about and we've been using for however long um, kind of, you know, to some level plateaued at a certain, you know, in some ways. What happened, uh, I would say somewhere around 2012, is some of it had to do with uh, faster computers, some of it had to do with, you know, more data. There's also this trick that's called automatic differentiation, which allows you to optimize a function. Like these neural networks have hundreds of millions of parameters in them. Okay, so you're optimizing a function with 100 million parameters in it. Like, that's not easy to do. You're not doing that with finite differences. So there's a bunch of engineering that made that kind of thing start to work better and better. And now there's a bunch of tools that make it really easy. And I think, in some sense, what's happened is you've seen these successes that I was showing you, and the level of ambition that we have is just, uh, like, you can start asking questions you've been laughed out of the room you know, five years ago for thinking about trying to do it. And now you can think, yeah, sure, why not? I'm going to optimize this, this function with, you know, 100,000, you know, parameters and blah, blah, and stick it, you know, like, sure, why not? You know, people do that stuff all the time now. And, and there's code to do it. And it's, you know, there's nice packages and it's easy to use. It's well documented. So in some sense, it's just so much, yeah, the, the bar has been lowered and our level of our ambition has been raised. Um, and then there are some honest to God, like new ideas and breakthroughs that have happened as well. So um, I don't know, I'm kind of, so I think that a lot of young people kind of realize it's happening. They want to learn about it. Um, but uh, you know, it's true, also true that the core stuff is the same linear algebra and, and you know, statistics that we've always been kind of teaching people. So, right, so we'll the next class coming in. Let's thank Kyle one more time. Okay. Thank you.